Hello Booktube, it's Sunday early evening here in the UK and it's time for an essay. We finished up with E.V. Lucas, his Domesticities, there were 12 essays there. Um, I'm going to do a series of essays uh, on bookish matters uh, by um, a favorite essayist of mine, Augustin Biro. Uh, he was a liberal politician. Uh, he was born in 1850 and died in 1933. From 1907 to 1960, he was Chief Secretary to Ireland. Uh, but after the um, um, Easter Rising, he um, he sort of had to leave the position. Um, but he, I just love his essays. Uh, he's quite humorous. And um, this uh, essay I'm going to read now was published in 1897 in his second series of Obiter Dicta, uh, which is a Latin saying, Obiter Dictum, sort of by the way saying, it's uh, not binding, legally binding, it's it's uh, more a judicial term, but he's used it for, for two uh, collections of essays. And this is the last essay in the second volume, 1897, it's called Book Buying. It's quite short, it's only a few pages long, so I'll read it in verbatim. Book buying. The most distinguished of living Englishmen, who, great as he is in many directions, is perhaps inherently more a man of letters than anything else, has been overheard mournfully to declare that there were more bookseller shops in his native town 60 years ago, when he was a boy in it, than a than are today to be found within its boundaries. And yet the place, all unabashed, now boasts its bookless self a city. Mr. Gladstone uh, was, of course, referring to second-hand bookshops. Neither he nor any other sensible man puts himself out oh, about new books. When a new book is published, read an old one, was the advice of a sound, tough, though a sound, though surly critic. It is one of the boasts of letters to have glorified the term second-hand, which other uh, crafts have soiled to all ignoble use. But why it has been able to do this is obvious. All the best books are necessarily second-hand. The writers of today need not grumble. Let them buy the we. If their books are worth anything, they too one day will be second-hand. If their books are not worth anything, there are ancient trades still in full operation amongst us, the pastry cooks and the trunk makers who must have paper. But is there any substance to the plaint that nobody now buys books, meaning thereby second-hand books? The late Mark Pattison, who had 16,000 volumes, and whose lightest word was therefore weight, once stated that he had been informed, and verily believed, that there were men of his own University of Oxford who, being in uncontrolled possession of annual incomes of not less than £500, thought they were doing the thing handsomely if they expanded expended 50 pounds a year upon their libraries. But we are not bound to believe this unless we like. There was a touch of morosity about the late rector of Lincoln, uh, which led him to take gloomy views of men, particularly Oxford men. No doubt arguments a priori uh, may readily be found to support the contention that the habit of book buying is on the decline. I confess to know one or two men, not Oxford men uh, either, but Cambridge men, and the passion of Cambridge for literature is a byword, who, on a plea of being uh, pressed with business or because they were going to a funeral, have passed a bookshop on a, uh, in a strange town without as much as stepping inside just to see whether the fellow had anything. But painful as facts of this sort necessarily are, any damaging inference we might feel disposed to draw from them is dispelled by a comparison of priceless. Compare a bookseller's catalogue of 1862 with one of the present year, 
and your pessimism is washed away by the t tears which unrestrainedly flow as you see the uh, bonds fortunes you have lost. A young book buyer might might well turn out upon Primrose Hill and be bemoan his youth after comparing old catalogs with new. Nothing but American competition grumbles some old staggers. Well, why not? This new battle for the books is a free fight, not a private one, and Columbia has joined in. Lower prices are not to be looked for. The book buyer of 1900 will be glad to buy at today's prices. I take pleasure in thinking he will not be able to do so. Good finds grow scarcer and scarcer. True it is that but a few short weeks ago I picked up such is the happy phrase most apt to describe uh, what was indeed a street casualty. A copy of the original edition of Endymion in a uh, Keats' poem, O oh, subscriber of to Maudie's, not Lord Beaconfield's novel, for the easy equivalent of half a crown, but then that was one of my lucky days. The enormous increase of booksellers' catalogues and their wide circulation amongst the trade has already produced a hateful uniformity of prices. Go where you will, it is all the same to all to the odd sixpence. Time was when you could map out the country for yourself with some hopefulness of plunder. There were districts where the Elizabethan dramatists were but slenderly protected. A raid into the bonny north country sent uh, sent you home with cherished again with cherished with chapbooks and weighted with old pamphlets of curious interest while the west of england seldom failed to yield a crop of novels i remember getting a complete set of bronte books in the original issues at torquay i may say for nothing the th those days are over your country bookseller is in fact more likely such tales does he hear from London auctions, and such catalogues does he receive by every post. Exaggerate the value of his wares, uh, then to part with them pleasantly, and as a country bookseller seller should, just to clear my shelves, you know, and give me a, l a bit of room. The only uh, compensation for this is the catalogues themselves. You get them at least for nothing, and it cannot be denied that they make mighty prettily reading. These high prices tell their own tale, and force upon us the conviction that there never were any, there were never, there never were so many private libraries in course of gross growth as they are today. Libraries are not made, they grow. Your first 2,000 volumes present no difficulty, and cost astonishingly little money. Given four hundred pounds in five years, and an ordinary man can, in the ordinary course, without undue haste or putting any pressure upon his taste, surround himself with this number of books, all in his own language, and thenceforward have at least one place in the world in which it is possible to be happy. But pride is still out of the question. To be proud of having two thousand books would be absurd. You might as well be proud of having two top coats. After your first 2,000, uh, difficulty begins. But until you have 10,000 volumes, the less you say about your library, the better. Then you may begin to speak. This is no doubt a pleasing, a, a pleasant thing to have. A, it is no doubt a pleasant thing to have a library left you. The present writer will disclaim no such legacy, but hereby undertakes to accept it, however dusty. But good as it is to inherit a library, it is better to collect one. Each volume, then, however lightly a stranger's eye may roam from shelf to shelf, has its own individuality, a history of its own. You remember where you got it, how much you gave for it, and your word may safely be taken for the first of these facts, but not for the second. The man who has a library of his own collection is able to contemplate himself objectively, and is justified in believing in his own existence. 
no other man but he would have made precisely such a combination as his. Had he been in any single respect different from what he is, his library, as it exists, never would have existed. Therefore, surely, he may exclaim, as in the gloaming he contemplates the back of his loved ones, They are mine, and I am theirs. But the eternal note of sadness will find its way even through the keyhole of the library. You turn some familiar page of Shakespeare, it may be, and his infinite variety, his multitudinous mind, suggests some new thought, and it is, and as you are wondering over it, you think of Lucides, Lucides, your friend who promised and promised yourself the pleasure of having his opinion of your discovery the very next time when by the fire you two heap waste, help waste a sullen day. Or it is perhaps some quainter, tenderer fancy that engages your solitary attention, something in Sir Philip Sidney or Henry Vaughan. And then you turn to look for Phyllis, over the best interpreter, ever the best interpreter of love, human or divine. Alas, the printed page grows hazy beneath the filmy eye, as you suddenly remember that Lucetus is dead, dead ere his time, ere his prime, and that the pale cheek of Phyllis will never again be relumined by the white light of her pure enthusiasm, and then you fall to thinking of the inevitable, and perhaps, in your present mood, not unwelcome hour, when the ancient peace of your old friends will be disturbed, when rude hands will dislodge them from their cursed, uh, their accustomed nooks and break up their goodly company. Death bursts among them like a shell and, str and strews them o over half the town. They will form new combinations, lighten other man's toils, and soothe uh, another brow. Fool that I was to call anything mine. I just love his, his humor uh, throughout it, um, and through the humor there's a lot of truth there. Uh, but it's interesting, 1897 it was written, and you can, the book buyer of today can make many, many things of talking about something 50 years ago, or 40 years ago as well. Um, it's it, it's just uncanny. It's like plus a chance, plus a la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Um, I've got um, just I got a few minutes here. I'll do. I've got two uh, collected essay volumes of Augusta Burl. Uh, the first two is the o Obiter Dicta, Dicta uh, first series, and then Obiter. Uh, Obiter Dicta second series, and then the second volume is Race Judaic T, uh, and then essays about men, women, and books. Uh, so the yeah, let's just go back for dates here. Obiter Dicta first series eighteen eighty four, second series eighteen eighty seven. Um, the uh, Res Judaici. 1892, and Essays About Men, Women, and Books, 1893. And these were published by Elliot Stock uh, in 1902 in two volumes. He's an honorary fellow, uh, Augustin Burrell, honorary fellow of Trinity Hall, Cambridge. Uh, I've got a couple others. Uh, there's one I can't find at the moment, uh, but this one is good, In the Name of the Bodleian. Um, it's 1904. 1905. It's in the name of the Bodley and another essays. Um, and we might grab one from there at some point. And the very first thing I got from it was selected essays in this wonderfully looking little book. Uh, look at the uh, detail and the embossing on the front cover. Uh, it's, the pages are quite warped up and it's cheaply made. But it's interesting. This was uh, done in 19... Seven or nine. Um, there's no date on it, but I did find it. There's Augusta Burrow right there. Uh, but it's interesting because 
these are essays, obviously, from 1894 to 1907. Yeah, 1909, I think it was published. Now, in, in the point where he, in the essay that I read, he says that, you know, the book Buyer of 1900, because he's writing from 1897, it's changed in here because it's 1909. It's changed to uh, the book buyer uh, of 1950. So it's interesting that there's little changes. So they updated it a little bit uh, for some reason. But even when that was uh, printed, that was 1902. So it was out of out of date there. But anyway, um, that that ends our essay uh, for today. And I will uh, be back in a day or two. Uh, probably two days with another essay and we'll continue there's about a half a dozen uh, really good ones by Augustine Burrow on books and I thought I'd uh, go through those take care book tube